praise His holy name this morning. I don't know about you, but I'm glad to be in church. Yes. Amen. 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 How many of you are glad this morning that you're in church? Amen. 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 I want you to open your Bibles this morning to the book of John. Maybe. I may have I may wind up in the book of Luke, but I want you to, we're going to start out with the John. And I'm thinking probably, I know it's chapter 3. Right now everybody's thinking he's going to preach on John 3.16, for God so loved the world. No, I'm not. That's just what I can think of. Because we, we mentioned the chap, we mentioned the book of John in chapter number 3, and that's what instantly everybody thinks about it. But there's more to the book of John than just the 16th and the 17th verse, although those are powerful verses. There's more to the book of John chapter 3. I think I'll probably start reading verse 22. There's a fella in the Old Testament scripture I think maybe in 1st or 2nd Samuel. It'd be 1st Samuel. There's a fellow in 1st in Samuel. His name is Nabal. How many of you ever heard of Nabal? Okay. For those of you who haven't heard of Nabal, Nabal was an arrogant, self-centered, proud man. You know, our world today is so full of arrogance Amen. and self-centeredness and pride. And all of those things are sinful. You know, we got a habit of making little name tags of it. I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed when I got here this morning. Brother George handed me this little pamphlet on, on pastor's conference. I love attending those pastor's conferences. But there's so many pastors and pastor's wives that attend the pastor's conferences. When you show up there, you got to sign in and and they and they they write your name on this tag, and the tag's got a pen, and for the whole time you're there, you gotta wear your name tag. That way they know who you are. In other words, we're identified by those name tags. I thought about telling them the name is Elvis one time. We're identified by those name tags. You know we got a habit of. And I've preached this before. I'm not going to sit on it very long. But we've got a habit of, 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 of putting sin on name tags. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we stack our name tags. We get a pile of name tags here. And these sins are the really bad ones. So we're going to stay away from them. Sin. <coughs> these sins here, they're really oh, something you'll kind of stuff. But these here, they're just little bitty sins. You know, and we categorize things like that. But according to the word of God, if sin is the only thing that can keep a person out of heaven, and it is, then one sin isn't any worse than the other. So the person who's just got a little bit of self-centeredness about him is just as bad off as a person who maybe is 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 got some type of uh, uh, like a homosexual name tag or, or something of that nature. Now, I know that's challenging. I know there's people who say, oh, Mark, oh, it doesn't matter what we like. We have to operate in what is true. And outside of Jesus Christ, we're all lost sinners, headed for a devil's hell. Inside of Jesus Christ, we're all saved by the grace of God. Amen. So if sin is the only thing that can keep a person out of heaven, I want my sin to be exposed. And the only way that we can expose sin is by allowing the Word of God to do in our lives what the Word of God has created to do in our lives. And that is to show us our depravity as mankind and our need for a Savior. It's all in Him. Nabal was an was a, was a egotistical, self-centered, arrogant man. And he was out in the wilderness one day sharing his sheep. Now he was married to a woman named Abigail. And Nabal and his men were in the wilderness shearing sheep. Now David was the king. And David, David was a good man. David was a good king. 
David looked after his people. David made sure that while the ball and the ball's men were out in the wilderness sharing his sheep, that nobody hurt him. Nobody touched his men. No thieves were allowed to come in, no robbers, no murderers. They were safe. Because if you were, if you were protected by David and David's fighting men, you were protected. David had protected these men. But they were getting ready to go out in battle. So David sent his men, ten men, to Nabal to ask for provisions. And when they got to Nabal, they said, we come in the name of David. And he is requesting some provisions. Nabal, the loud, arrogant, self-centered man that he was, said, who is this David? I mean, he just he just ripped David's servants to pieces. Give you the long and short of it. He refused them. He sent them back. Well, another thing about David is if David got mad at you, that was probably the worst person you could ever have mad at you. And so David bowed about. <laughs> he said, I'm going to get my men together. We're going to go down. I'm going to find the ball. And we're going to destroy him. Abigail, Nabal's wife, who later became David's wife, spoke up and said, Nabal is his name. And his name means fool. Nabal's acting like a fool. You don't want to do this, David, and bring sin and reproach. There's a good message in that. We're not going to answer for the Nabals of this world. Amen. We're only going to answer for ourselves. Amen. So oftentimes we get manipulated into reacting <coughs> off of somebody else's action. Before you know it, everybody's just reacting and there's no more action going on. What we really need to do is just stop and come to understand. I'm not going to answer for Nabal, but I am going to answer for Thad. And I need to keep Thad's nose out of the out of the ringer. And boy, there's a big message in that. If we can sit on that one, if I can just continue preaching that, we can fill this altar up today. Abigail said, don't do it. Don't go after him. He's not worth it. Just let it go. God will take care of him. How many of you know that God will take care of what needs to be taken care of? When we seek to operate in vengeance, then all we're doing is committing a sin that we need to fall on our face about and ask forgiveness. The scriptures of God said, Vengeance is mine, and I shall repay. Abigail said, Don't do it, David. I know it's my husband, David, but I'm telling you, he's loud, he's arrogant. <laughs> His name is Nabal, and Nabal means fool. Don't go after him. It ain't going to matter anyway. So David calmed down and God took care of him. The ball died. Abigail became David's wife. The rest is history. How many of you know that we live in a self-centered, egotistical, arrogant world? Everything is all about self. And I've really been struggling with this. I've really been praying about this.
I can tell you what it is. It's self-centeredness. Amen. We get what we want, we're happy. We don't get what we want, we're unhappy. Amen. Where's Jesus Christ in the equation? Where's following the scripture in the equation? Where is coming to understand that if God be for us, who can stand against us? Amen. Where is understanding that if we're in Christ and Christ is in us, we are His sheep. He's our shepherd. Where, where is that? Well, ain't your fault. That, that starts here. And so this morning, I want to read some scripture to you. About a time when John the Baptist, who was the forerunner of Christ, had, had prophesied about Christ coming. And see, they all wanted to lift him up. They wanted his head to swell. They wanted... I'm getting ahead of myself. But John, John told them, John told them, there's one who's coming after me who is preferred before me. He's mightier than I am. And his shoes, I'm not even worthy to bend down and untie and take his shoes off. He said, I baptize you with water, but he's going to baptize you with fire and with the Holy Ghost. And I'm thankful today for a fire baptism. Because had the heat of the Holy Ghost not set down on me and burned my flesh and showed me my need for a loving Savior, I might still be out hanging in a honky tonk somewhere with a guitar break over my shoulder as lost as a goose. But when the fire of the Lord fell upon me and showed me my need for a Savior, it burnt me to the point where I could not wait to fall down on an altar and say, Lord, have mercy upon me and save me in my soul. Save me of my sins. And when I got up, the fire that was on me got inside me and I became a new creature in Christ. And that's not for me only, but that's for every one of you that are in here this morning who are in Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus is in you. The scripture says in John chapter 3, verse 22, after these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea. And he tarried with them. And he baptized. Now here's Jesus on the scene. He's got his own disciples. They're coming into Judea. And Jesus is baptizing. And John also was baptizing. In a neon near Salem. Because there was much water there. And they came. And were baptized. So here we got Jesus. The one that John prophesied about in the same area. And we got John in the same area and they're both baptized. I needed to set that scene. You need to see it. You need to close your eyes and use your imagination and take a look down there at that running water and all the people that are coming. And you got Jesus here and you got John here and you got people lining up and they're baptized. You need to get this vision. For John was not yet cast into prison. And here it comes. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. Isn't there always an argument? Isn't there always somebody that's got something to say that when all is said and done, they should step, just sit down and shut up and not say anything we can do? And they came into John and they said unto him, Red eye. Why well, isn't that just a term of endurance? Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Endearment? Isn't that a term of endearment? Isn't that a term of. That, that just sounds so official, doesn't it? That just sounds like. That just sounds like they really love this guy. Red eye. Come down to John the Baptist. They didn't go to Jesus. Notice that? They didn't go to Jesus. They came to John. Then where are you sitting on this? I'm sitting on it on purpose. You're going to get it here in a minute. They came to John and they called John Rabbi. Now these, it wasn't too long ago when John come down out of the mountain country, dressed in camel's hair, had a leather girdle on him, he was eating a locust, and he had a jar of wild honey. 
His hair's all wild and he's preaching <laughs> to repent of your sins and perish because the day of the Lord is at hand. Jesus Christ is coming and he's going to thoroughly purge his floor and he's going to take the wheat and put it into the garner or the barn but the shaft. He's going to burn You know, because they were all prim and proper. They had all their nice priestly robes and they had their tassels and their and their fringes hanging off of it. They had their purple belts on. They had all of that kind of stuff on. They looked the part. This guy come down out. You know what? I, one time I had somebody, I had, I don't normally tell people that I'm a preacher on purpose for a couple reasons. One, if I have to tell you I'm a preacher, I'm probably not very good. <laughs> Secondly, when you tell somebody that you're a preacher, then they instantly start acting like somebody that they're not. And I like real people. Yeah. I preach. I believe in a real Jesus Christ. I believe in a real word. I believe in preaching real messages to real people. And I don't want nothing phony or fake. Amen. And as soon as I tell somebody that I'm a preacher, well, they're, gonna, they're just going to be the biggest saint that you've ever seen. <laughs> so on purpose, I don't tell people that. One day, in conversation, talking to a guy who I had known for a little while now, it came up that I'm a preacher. And he said, you're a preacher? I said, yeah. He said, well, I never would have said some of the things I did. I said, that's why I didn't tell you. He said, well, you don't look much like a preacher. I said, well, thank you for the compliment. <laughs> I don't know what that meant. You know, maybe, maybe he thought I needed to have on a bow tie and a little pocket protector with ink pens and you know, one of them. I don't know what a preacher is supposed to look like. But I can tell you, when John come down out of the mountain, he didn't look like, he didn't look like one of them. And they were ripping on him. They were snorting on him. They didn't like his message. He looked him right square in the eye and he said, you generation of vipers who have warned you to flee from the wrath. <laughs> they didn't like him for it. But now today, Here's Jesus. And here's John. They don't like Jesus. They don't like John. How can we stop this? Let's go to John. Let's build John up. Let's stroke John's ego. This guy that we were laughing about because he was crunching on a locust and sucking down some honey and looked like that mountain man. That come Let's go. Hey, Rabbi. Uh -huh. Do you see? Even that in Jesus' day, there was manipulation and deception. And I've got to tell you the truth. I love you enough this morning to tell you the truth. If you have to manipulate your way through life to get what you want, you need to find Jesus Christ. Amen. I lost my place. Where were we? Verse 26. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizes, and all men come to him. Do you see what was, you see what they were trying to do there? They were trying to create a division between John and Jesus. They were trying to get John's dander up, so to speak. That's how they'd say it down home. They were trying to push the right buttons. How many of you know that you've got buttons? Oh, no, I don't have the buttons, Pastor Dad. Oh, yes, you do. You can. <laughs> Character. 
close your eyes and say, Lord, forgive me because I fell and I sinned. The devil doesn't want us to be in an agreement with one another. The devil wants us to be separated from one another. Because if you can divide, you can conquer. It's the oldest trick in the book. Amen. But yet it's the one that we get deceived by so often. The old trick of divide and conquer. They came to John. They called him rabbi. They built him up. And then they said, you know that fellow? They even knew his name. They knew his name. Why didn't they say Jesus? They knew who he was. But they're acting like, they're acting like John's the important one here. And Jesus is a, is a he's crowding in on them. They didn't say Jesus, whom you prophesied about. Because that whole conversation would have went another way. They said, that, that guy, you know, the one. I can't quite recall his name, but it's the one that you were talking about down the door. Why, he's here. And he's baptizing people. And you know what, Rabbi? Everybody's going to him. What happened to your crowd? What happened to your congregation? Where's your people at? They're all, they, all men are going to him. Wouldn't that be nice if all men went to Jesus? Amen. Wouldn't it just be nice? If all men, if all women, if every boy, if every girl, if every man, if every woman stop chasing after the almighty dollar, stop chasing after themselves and what they want, and just start chasing after Jesus, our nation would be, we'd experience such a revival that there'd be such a move of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Mm. Another message for another day. And John answered and said, you see, there's something about <laughs> there's just something about a true child of God. They got some unction about it. There's something different about it. Do you remember back in the Old Testament when Pharaoh wanted to destroy all of the male seed? And so he told the midwives. <laughs> When they get ready to deliver a child, if it's a boy, you're supposed to kill the boy. All of Don't let any of the boys live. Just let the girls live. And the reason for that is if you can kill the male, you can kill the seed. If you kill the seed, then the devil can have brought it all to an end. But something happened. Males just kept being born. Pharaoh got mad. about Jesus Christ. Amen. And it's about the Holy Spirit that lives and dwells on the inside. Amen. The scripture says if any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away and all things are. You're a new creation. You're, you're something that this world has no clue about. So when they go to press Egypt's button, Egypt just presses back. When they go to press a worldly button, the world just presses back. When you press the child of God's button, there's going to be something on the inside that's going to say, yeah! but then the greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, and it's going to speak. <laughs> You're going to say, I don't need to do this. They brought forth their babies. They brought forth their sons because they were different from the Egyptian women. And to be honest with you, the midwives were a little bit
Jesus had not yet died on the cross or resurrected, so how could he have the Holy Ghost? It's simple. God. God put it in. Do you remember when Mary and Elizabeth were both pregnant at the same time? And do you remember when Mary went to visit Elizabeth? Do you know who Elizabeth is? I might be assuming here. Elizabeth is John the Baptist's mother. So do you remember in the scripture when Mary, the mother of Jesus, came to visit Elizabeth, the mother of John? And when Mary spoke 